Welcome to, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man, end times Bible study. My name is Colley and I'm joined by my husband of 23 years, Audie. Audie is an ordained minister with a degree in theology and ministry. He serves full-time as a chaplain with hospice, and he is not only my husband, but also the father of our children. He's my pastor and my best friend. We'd like to get started by suggesting you first review the book of Revelation Revealed Bible Study prior to this one. There's much detail in the book of Revelation Revealed, which will lay the groundwork for this second end-time study. If you're currently well-versed in the book of Revelation, we still feel it would be valuable reviewing the book of Revelation Revealed, as we're confident you'll receive some additional insight. Or if you're like we were when we began studying the book of Revelation, our hope is that by going through that study, it will be less intimidating and not as scary. Now, the book of Revelation Revealed study can be accessed through the links below. So let's get started. As we were preparing for this study, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man, I was praying and the Holy Spirit whispered to me, a tempest is coming. Now, tempest is not a word I use, and although I know it's a reference to a storm, I looked up the definition. And the first was a violent windstorm, frequently accompanied by rain, snow, or hail. But the second definition is what I believe the Holy Spirit was referring to. And that definition is furious agitation, commotion, or tumult and uproar. And my eyes focused in on the word tumult, so I looked that up. And it says a loud, confused noise, especially one caused by a large mass of people. And then the second definition for tumult is the din and commotion of a great crowd, tempestuous uprising, a riot. I believe that we are going to see, and we're already seeing, that the world, the United States, people are confused, and it's going to grow to a loud, confused noise here in the United States, and even rioting, and it'll spread worldwide. The book of God and the word of God is truth, and we're seeing the prophecies of the Bible coming to pass daily. There were over 300 prophecies about the Messiah many of which are in the book of Isaiah. A copy of the book of Isaiah, well actually a scroll of it, was found in the Dead Sea area about 70 years before Jesus was born. And Jesus fulfilled all 300 of those prophecies. Because it was found before he was born, no one can say that his disciples wrote those prophecies. Jesus is the only man that has ever lived who has fulfilled all 300 plus prophecies. The chance of, of one man in all of history filling all of those is astronomical, yet Jesus did. He is the Jewish Messiah for the whole world and God in the flesh. In the first chapter of it says of John, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And it goes on a few verses later to say, And the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst men. Jesus came to pay a price for mankind that we could never pay ourselves. All we need to do is believe that his death paid the price for all our sins, faults, failures, and invite him into our lives. Now, sometimes believing is the difficult part. But, you know, Jesus', Jesus disciples went to him and they said to him, We believe, but help us with our unbelief. Isn't that the way that we are? We believe, but we can go to Jesus and say, But we have unbelief. Help us. Deliver us from unbelief. Then once we've asked him and believe that he's paid the price for all of our sins, our failures, our faults, we should invite him into our lives. And then we need to change our minds. You know, that's what the word repentance means. It means to change our mind. We need to change our mind about what we've been doing, that it's wrong and sin, and we ask him to help us change. You know, it's hard to change yourself, but we can ask him, and he'll help us change. Please don't let anyone deceive you. All roads do not lead to God. If four people leave Fort Lauderdale Airport and they drive in four different directions, they will end up in four different places. If you've never asked Jesus into your life, I encourage you, do it now. Time is short. Just say, Jesus, I believe you died on the cross 
to pay the price for my sins and failures. And I ask you to come into my life and change me into the person you want me to become. And I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I would know your will and that I would have the strength and the power to do your will. Thank you, Jesus. Now, if you pray that or something like it, if you, in your own words, pray and call out to him and say, I need you, he will come into your life and change you and help you. Now, for those of us who have known the Lord for many years, we now need to fully understand that we are living in the very last days. We all need to ask the Lord to deliver us from error and deception and humbly ask him to fill us with truth and open the eyes of our understanding. This is why there's so many voices out there in prophecies and differences in prophecies. We need to come to the Lord and ask him, deliver us from error and fill us with your truth. He says that he is faithful and just. He is. We ask him. He will answer us. So what was going on in the days of Noah that Jesus was referring to in Matthew 24? Well, we're going to read scriptures, and whenever we see underlined portions of scriptures, it's going to be a focus for us. In Genesis 6, 1 and 2, it says, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Now, I don't know about you, but I've always wondered, who are the sons of God, and what's the difference between the sons of God and we have the daughters of men? Well, I had always been taught that the sons of God was referring to the righteous line of Seth, so it was sons of the, of the line of Seth, versus the unrighteous line of Cain, or rather, the daughters of the line of Cain. Well, let's think about this. In Genesis 3, Adam and Eve fell before Seth was born. So Seth was born into unrighteousness. He was born into original sin. In Genesis 5, 1 through 3, it says, This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man in the likeness of God, made he him. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness and after his image and called his name Seth. Prior to Seth, it's never stated that Adam had a son in his own likeness and after his image. Even with Cain and Abel, it's not phrased that way. This is the first time it's phrased that way, that, that Seth was a son in Adam's likeness and in Adam's image. And that's because of the fall. Prior to that, all the creation, mankind was in God's image. In a couple of slides, we'll get back to the sons of God versus the daughters of men. But just going on in Genesis, it says there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And what, what do we think of when we think giants and mighty men? Well, it sounds like Greek and Roman demigods, giants and mighty men like Hercules. Giantism, in modern day, we've proven that it's a genetic issue. Take a look at this picture of some bones of a giant that were found. And amazingly, this is much larger than a giant in David's day, Goliath, who was nine feet tall. This giant is huge. An international research team spearheaded by scientists from the London School of Medicine and Dentistry has identified the specific gen genetic mutation responsible for giantism. So there were genetic issues in the days of Noah? I mean, it's not too long after creation. What does this mean, really? Where can we get answers? We can get answers 
from the prophet Enoch on the sons of God versus the daughters of men and on the giants and the mighty men of renown. And who is Enoch? Well, in the genealogy in Genesis, it says that Jared lived 160 and two years and he begat Enoch. And Jared lived after he begat Enoch 800 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Jared were 960 and two years and he died. And Enoch lived 60 and five years and begat Methuselah. Remember, Methuselah was supposedly the wisest man that ever lived. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. Why, when people lived so long back there, Jared lived 900 years, why did Enoch only live 360 and five years? And it goes on to say, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. We first learn of Enoch in Genesis 5, but it leaves us with questions. Then in Hebrews, it says, by faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. So Hebrew 11 has the answers. Enoch was translated. He was raptured, and he was raptured because he pleased God. So in Jude it says, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these saying. So the next part in quotation marks is a quote from Enoch. So Enoch prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So Jude is quoting Enoch. How did Jude come to know the words of Enoch? They're not in the Bible. You can go to an online Bible, do a word search, Enoch, and Enoch comes up exactly three times. It comes up in the genealogy, which we read in Genesis. Enoch comes up in Hebrews, where it says he was translated because he had this testimony that he pleased God. And then it comes up here in Jude, where Jude is actually quoting Enoch. The answer is... Jude got it from the book of Enoch. It's a book which is actually quoted by Jude in the New Testament. What is the book of Enoch, and where did it come from? Well, Enoch was the great-grandfather of Noah, and because people lived so long back then, they knew their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, even their great-great-grandchildren. In the book of Enoch, chapter 68, it says, and after that, my great-grandfather Enoch gave me all the secrets in the book and in the parables which had been given to him. And he put them together for me in the words of the book of the parables. So obviously, Noah had the book of Enoch and he took it on the ark with him with the other um, books and, and parchments and scrolls that he had been given. And that's how Jude and other New Testament writers um, read. There's much of the New Testament, there's terms like the Son of Man, which is never mentioned anywhere in the Old Testament. It's very messianic, and that's something that's in the book of Enoch. So it's believed that a lot of the New Testament writers were reading the book of Enoch, and it was part of their writings. The book of Enoch was considered scripture by the early Christians. The earliest literature of the Church Fathers is filled with references to this mysterious book. The Epistle of Barnabas quotes much of the book of Enoch, and my husband shared with me that going through seminary that they read the Epistle of Barnabas. Barnabas traveled with Paul, and even though it didn't become uh, part of the canon of the word, it still is um, a, a book that, uh, that is read in seminary. The second and third century church fathers like Justin Martin, Irenaeus, Origen, and Clement of Alexandria all mentioned the book of Enoch in their writings. Tertullian called the book of Enoch Holy Scripture. The Ethiopic church even added the book of Enoch to its official canon and it's part of its official canon, its official Bible today. It's widely known and it was read for the first three centuries after Christ. But then this and many other books became discredited by the Council of Laodicea 
And yes, this is the same church of Laodicea that's mentioned in the book of Revelations, where Jesus said, I you wish you were um, either hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. <laughs> I don't know about the Laodicea church. But the book of Enoch was under ban because of the council of Laodicea's decision. Um, it was under ban of the authorities, and afterwards it gradually just passed out of circulation. But about the time of the Protestant Reformation, and thank God for the Protestant Reformation, there was a renewed interest in the book of Enoch. By the late 1400s, rumors had begun to spread that somewhere a copy of the long-lost book of Enoch might still exist. During this time, there were books that arose that were claiming to be the book of Enoch, but they were found to be forgeries. The return of the long-lost book of Enoch to the modern Western world is credited to the explorer James Bruce, who in 1773 returned from six years in Abyssinia with three complete Ethiopic copies of the lost book. In 1821, Richard Lawrence published the first English translation, and then in 1912, the R.H. Charles edition was published. In the following years, there were several portions of the Greek text of Enoch which surfaced. So we not only had it in Ethiopian language, but also in Greek. And then there was the big discovery of cave number four of the Dead Sea Scrolls. That find included seven different fragmentary copies of the Aramaic text of Enoch. So when they compared the full Ethiopic copies with the portions of the Greek text that were found and the Aramaic text that was found, guess what? It all translated the same, so it's a credible witness and a credible testimony. But the King James Version was first translated in 1500, and then the official King James was in the 1600s, so the book of Enoch never made it into the canon of the Bible or was never part of the discussion because the first copies weren't even found till 1773. With God, there are no coincidences. The reason the book of Enoch was lost is explained prophetically in the first chapter of the book of Enoch by Enoch himself. In the book of Enoch, there is five basic parts. There's the Book of the Watchers, which we are going to read and focus on part of that as it relates to this Bible study, as it was in the days of Noah, because it defines for us who these sons of God are. The second book, the Book of Parables, is absolutely remarkable. It's extraordinarily messianic, and there's terms in there like the Son of Man, which were only used by the early church fathers, New Testament um, these are New Testament terms. They're not mentioned in the Old Testament, and yet they were in the book of Enoch. So it's believed that most of the New Testament, they were referring to the book of Enoch. Then there's the book of astronomy, and of course astronomy and astrology are different. Astronomy, the Bible says that the heavens declare the glory of God. And then there's the book of dreams and the epistle of Enoch. So, we're going to get started, and we are going to read a few chapters in the book of Enoch, and that will be the end of the first part of the study, and then we'll, on the next uh, study, start to discuss some of the things that we're covering. But let's read through this today. This is translated from the Ethiopian by R.H. Charles in 1906, and there's also some edits in here, so when we get to portions that are in parentheses, these are the edits that were put in by Wolf Carnahan in 1997. So chapter 1, the words of the blessing of Enoch, wherewith he blessed the elect and righteous. You know, the elect, this is a term that's a New Testament term. Um, the elect and righteous who will be living in the day of tribulation when all the wicked and godless are to be removed. And he took up his parable and said, Enoch, a righteous man whose eyes were opened by God, saw the vision of the Holy One in the heavens which the angels showed me. And from them I heard everything, and from them I understood as I saw, but not for this generation, but for a remote one. 
So Enoch's basically saying that the words of the blessing of Enoch they're for a people who are going to be living in the day of tribulation. That they're not for this generation, but they're for a remote one. And this is referring to us. But, re but for a remote one, which is to come. Concerning the elect, I said, and took up my parable concerning them. The Holy Great One will come forth from his dwelling, and the eternal God will tread upon the earth, even on Mount Sinai and appear in the strength of his might from the heaven of heavens, and all shall be smitten with fear, and the watchers, and I'll just let you know right now, watchers are a group of angels, and the watchers shall quake, and great fear and trembling shall seize them unto the ends of the earth, and the high mountains shall be shaken, and the high hills shall be made low, and shall melt like wax before the flame, and the earth shall be wholly rent in sunder, and all that is upon the earth shall perish, and there shall be a judgment upon all men. This is the second coming of Christ. But with the righteous he will make peace, and will protect the elect, and mercy shall be upon them. And they shall all belong to God, and they shall be prospered, and they shall be blessed. And he will help them all, and light shall appear unto them, and he will make peace with them. And behold, he cometh with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all, and to destroy all the ungodly, and to convict all flesh of all the works of their ungodliness which they have ungodly committed, and all the hard things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. This is an exact quote that's in the book of Jude in the New Testament. The book of Jude is the book right before Revelations, and it's exactly translated exactly the same way in the book of Enoch. So in chapter 2 through chapter 5, we're not going to read through this. Uh, we're just going to leap through it real quickly. But basically what Enoch is saying is that when you observe things in heaven and in nature and all these things, they all point to God. So, um, you know, he's saying, observe ye everything that takes place in heaven. And it goes on to say and observe and see how the in the winter all the trees and and again observe ye the days of summer how the sun is above the earth and observe ye how the trees cover themselves with green leaves and then he goes on in verse two there and all his works go on thus from year to year forever and all the tasks which they accomplish for him and their tasks change not but according as god hath ordained so it's done and he goes on you know, and then it goes on here in chapter 5, differentiating between those that are cursed and the sinners and the godless. And then it talks in here about the elect, and it shall be a bestowed upon them wisdom, and they shall live and never again sin, either through ungodliness or through pride. But they who are wise shall be humble, and it's referring to the saints of God. So now we get to chapter 6, and we're going to read chapter 6 through chapter 16. And it came to pass when the children of men had multiplied, that in those days were born unto them beautiful and comely daughters. And the angels, and another word for these angels is watchers, and the angels, the children of heaven, saw and lusted after them and said, to one another, Come, let us choose us wives from among the children of men, and beget us children. Now, you may be thinking right then and there, Oh, come on, this is ridiculous. Angels can't have children. There's scripture verses that we will get to that are in the Bible that proves that the sons of God are angels. So just bear with me and let's read through this. And the angels, the children of heaven, saw and lusted after the beautiful, comely daughters of men, and said to one another, Come, let us choose us wives from among the children of men, and beget us children. And Semjaza, who was their leader, said unto them, I fear ye will not indeed agree to do this deed, and I alone shall have to pay the penalty of a great sin. And they all answered him and said, Let us all swear an oath, and all bind ourselves by mutual imprecations. Not to abandon this plan, but to do this thing. Then swear they all together and bound themselves by mutual imprecations upon it. And they were in all two hundred who descended in the days of Jared on the summit of Mount Hermon. And they called it Mount Hermon because they had sworn and bound themselves by mutual imprecations upon it. 
And these are the names of their leaders. Sam Lezazaz, their leader, Arak Laba, Ramil, Koka Balel, Temlel, Remlel, Danel, Ezekiel, Barakajel, Asiel, Armaros, Batarel, Ananel, Zakiel, Sam Zapil, Satariel, Turiel, Jamjel, Sariel. These were their chiefs of ten. So each one of them had ten angels under them who came. And all the others together with them took unto themselves wives, and each chose for himself one. And they began to go in unto them and to defile themselves with them, and they taught them charms and enchantments and the cutting of roots, and made them acquainted with plants. And they became pregnant, and they bare great giants whose height was three thousand L's. This is much larger, much taller than the giants in uh, David's day, Goliath and his brothers. And these giants consumed all the acquisitions of men, and when men could no longer sustain them, the giants turned against them and started to devour mankind. And they began to sin. This is talking about sexually. They began to sin against birds and beasts and reptiles and fish. So this is where the mutations that we read about in Greek and Roman and ancient mythology of half beasts and half man and Pegasus and these types of things, these are where these stories came from. And they began to devour one another's flesh. So the giants started to each eat each other and drink the blood. Then the earth laid accusation against the lawless ones, the lawless ones um, being the giants. And Azazel taught men to make swords and knives and shields and breastplates and made known to them the metals of the earth and the art of working them and bracelets and ornaments and the use of antimony and the beautifying of the eyelids and all kinds of costly stones and all coloring tinctures. And there arose much godlessness and they committed fornication. So they taught men how to pull the minerals out of the earth. Man didn't know how to do that prior to this. And of course, we know that Cain killed Abel, you know, I mean, without a, without a sword, but obviously this increased violence. And they committed fornication, and they were led astray and became corrupt in all their ways, meaning mankind. Semjaza taught enchantments and root cuttings. Armoros, the resolving of enchantments. Birakajel taught astrology. Kokobel, the constellations. Ezekiel, the knowledge of the clouds. Arikiel, the signs of the earth. Sham, Siel, the signs of the sun. Siriel, the course of the moon. And as men perished, the men that perished, their souls, they cried, and their cry went up to heaven. And then Michael, Uriel, Raphael, and Gabriel looked down from heaven and saw much blood being shed upon the earth, and all lawlessness being wrought upon the earth. And they said one to another, The earth made without inhabitant cries the voice of their crying up to the gates of heaven. And now to you, the holy ones, of heaven, the souls of men make their suit, saying, Bring our cause. These are the souls of men. These are men that have died. Okay? And it says, Bring our cause before the Most High. And they said to the Lord of ages. Now this is the four angels going to God. And they're saying to God, Lord of lords, God of God, King of kings, and God of the ages, the throne of thy glory standeth unto all the generations of the ages, and thy name holy and glorious and blessed unto all the ages. Thou hast made all things, and power over all things vast hast thou, and all things are naked and open in thy sight, and thou seest all things, and nothing can hide itself from thee. Thou seest what Azazel hath done, who hath taught all unrighteousness on earth, and revealed the eternal secrets which were preserved in heaven, which men were striving to learn. And Samjaza, to whom thou hast given authority to bear rule over his associates. And they have gone to the daughters of men upon the earth, and have slept with the women, and have defiled themselves, and revealed to them all kinds of sins. And the women have borne giants, and the whole earth has thereby been filled with blood and unrighteousness. And now behold, the souls of those who have died are crying and making their suit to the gates of heaven, and their lamentations have ascended, and cannot cease because of the lawless deeds which are wrought on the earth. And thou knowest all things before they come to pass, and thou seest these things, and thou dost suffer them, and thou dost not say to us what, we're our, what we are to do to them in regard to these. 
So the angels are going to God and they're basically saying to God, you know everything, you know this is happening, but you haven't told us what to do. Because God gave the angels charge over all of this. So it was up to the angels that hadn't fallen to go to God. Then said the Most High, the Holy and Great One, he spake, and he sent Uriel to the son of Lamech, and said to him, Go to Noah, and tell him in my name, Hide thyself, and reveal to him the end that is approaching, and that the whole earth will be destroyed, and that a deluge is about to come upon the whole earth, and will destroy all that is on it. And now instruct him that he may escape, and his seed may be preserved for all the generations of the world. So let's stop there and let's talk about this. What was going on in Noah's day? Yes, there was violence all over the earth, but what was causing the violence? We have a genetic mutation because angels were leaving their first habitation. They were leaving the spiritual. They were coming down to earth and they were mating with women. And there was a genetic mutation that was happening. So he says to send an angel to um, Noah and he says hide thyself probably because he didn't want anything to happen to Noah and his seed and he said to instruct him that he may escape and his seed may be preserved for all the generations of the world his seed meaning the children that would come out of the out of his line so that there wouldn't be any more genetic mutations and again the Lord said to Raphael bind Azazel he was the leader right who the one who thought up the scheme to begin with hand and foot, and cast him into the darkness. Now remember this, and cast him into the darkness. And make an opening in the desert, which is in Dudel, and cast him therein, and place upon him rough and ragged rocks, and cover him with darkness, and let him abide there forever, and cover his face, that he may not see light. And on the day of the great judgment, he shall be cast into the fire. When's he talking about the great judgment, the great white throne judgment? He's going to be cast into the lake of fire. And heal the earth which the angels have corrupted and proclaim the healing of the earth that they may heal the plague and that all the children of men may not perish through all the secret things that the watchers have disclosed and have taught their sons. And who are their sons? These are the giants. And the whole earth has been corrupted through the works that were taught by Azazel to him, Azazel, ascribe all sin. And to Gabriel, said the Lord, proceed against the bastards and the retrobates and against the children of fornication. So who is he talking about? He's talking about the children of the watchers, the fallen angels, and the women. Destroy all of them, the bastards and the retrobates, and against the children of fornication. So it's also including in there the giants that started to have sex with the ber birds and the fish and the animals of the earth. He's saying destroy them all. And then it says send them one against the other that they may destroy each other in battle. For length of days they shall they not have. And no request that their fathers make of thee shall be granted unto their fathers on their behalf. For they hope to live an eternal life and that each one of them will live 500 years. So he's saying that the angels hope to live an eternal life and that their children, because their children were flesh, would live 500 years. And the Lord said unto Michael, Go bind some jazz and his associates who have united themselves with women so as to have defiled themselves with them and all their uncleanness. And when their sons have slain one another and they have seen the destruction of their beloved ones, then bind them fast for 70 generations. And we'll talk about that later in the valleys of the earth till the day of their judgment and of their consummation, till the judgment that is forever and ever is consummated. In those days they shall be led off to the abyss of fire and to the torment and the prison in which they shall be confined forever. And whosoever shall be condemned and destroyed will from thenceforth be bound together with them to the end of all generations. We don't want to be condemned because we don't want to be bound together with them to the end of all generations. And then it goes on, it's still talking about after the millennial reign of Christ at the great white throne judgment, it's saying to destroy all the spirits of the retrobate and the children of the watchers because they have wronged mankind. Now the physical bodies of the retrobate, the, the giants and the children of fornication and all of that, 
their physical bodies were killed because he says to send them against each other, that they kill each other, but their spirits are left over and their spirits will be destroyed at the great white throne judgment because they've wronged mankind. And then it's going on, still talking about that time frame um, after the great white throne judgment, destroy all wrong from the face of the earth and let every evil work come to an end and let the plant of righteousness and truth appear and it shall prove a blessing. The works of righteousness and truth shall be planted in truth and joy forevermore. And then shall all the righteous escape and they shall live till they beget thousands of children and all the days of their youth and their old age shall they complete in peace. And then shall the whole earth be tilled in righteousness and shall all be planted with trees and be full of blessing and all desirable trees shall be planted on it and they shall plant vines on it and the vine which they plant thereon shall yield wine in abundance and as for the seed which is sown thereon each measure of it shall bear a thousand so we're not talking about thirty sixty a hundred fold we're talking a thousand fold and each measure of olives shall yield ten presses of oil and cleanse thou the earth from all oppression and from all unrighteousness and from all sin and from all godlessness and all uncleanness that is wrought upon the earth destroy from off the earth and we know that this is after the millennial reign of Christ because during the millennial reign of Christ we know that there is still some sin on the earth at that time and we know that their nations of the earth come against uh, Israel after the end of the thousand years. So this is talking about after the thousand years. This is talking about after the great white throne judgment. There will never be any sin all of it is destroyed off the earth and all the children of men shall become righteous and all nations shall offer adoration and shall praise me and all shall worship me and the earth shall be cleansed from all defilement and from all sin and from all punishment and from all torment and I will never again send upon them I send them upon it from generation to generation and forevermore. And in those days I will open the store chambers of blessing which are in heaven so as to send them down upon the earth over the work and labor of the children of men. And truth and peace shall be associated together throughout the, all the days of the world and throughout all the generations of men. Now we're going to be in our glorified bodies ruling and reigning with Christ during the millennial reign and then into eternity. But we know that there will be people during the millennial reign of Christ and then into eternity that are in their physical bodies. And what it's saying is is that man is going to be blessed he's going to everything that they do it's going to be blessed it's going to be blessed before these things Enoch was hidden and no one of the children of men knew where he was hidden and where he abode and what had become of him and his activities had to do with the watchers and his days were and his days were with the holy ones so what's this referring to well remember Enoch was translated he went to heaven so he was hidden no one none of men knew where he was what had happened but he had been with the angels in heaven he had gone to heaven um, he had been with the watchers and his days were with the holy ones and then he says and I Enoch was blessing the Lord of majesty and the king of ages and lo the watchers called me Enoch the scribe, okay? So he's saying he was with, you know, he was blessing the Lord of Majesty, the King of Ages. And by the way, the watchers called me Enoch the scribe. And the Lord of Majesty, the King of Ages, said to me, Enoch, thou scribe of righteousness, go declare to the watchers of the heaven who have left the high heaven the holy eternal place and have defiled themselves with women and have done as the children of earth do and have taken unto themselves wives ye have wrought so he's saying say unto them ye have wrought great destruction on the earth and ye shall have no peace nor forgiveness of sin and inasmuch as they delight themselves in their children the murder of their beloved ones shall they see so they're going to see the destruction of their children the giants and the mighty men of known renown and they shall lament and shall make supplication unto eternity, but mercy and peace shall ye not attain. And Enoch went and said, As a zeal thou shalt have no peace, a severe sentence has gone forth against thee to put thee in bonds, and thou shalt not have toleration, nor request granted to thee because of the unrighteousness which thou hast taught, and because of all the works of godlessness and unrighteousness and sin which thou hast shown to men. 
Then after he spoke to Azel, he went to all the rest of them together, and they were all afraid, and fear and trembling seized them, and they besought me to draw up a petition for them that they might find forgiveness, and to read their petition in the presence of the Lord of heaven. For from thenceforward they could not speak with him, nor lift up their eyes to heaven for shame of their sins for which they had been condemned. Then I wrote out their petition and the prayer in regard to their spirits and their deeds individually, and in regard to their request that they should have forgiveness and length. And I went off and sat down at the waters of Dan in the land of Dan to the south of the west of Hermon. I read their petition till I fell asleep, and behold, a dream came to me, and visions fell down upon me, and I saw visions of chastisement, and a voice came bidding me to tell it to the sons of heaven, and reprimand them. And when I awaked, I came unto them, and they were all sitting, gathered together, weeping in Abel's gel, which is between Lebanon and Senesir, with their faces covered. And I recounted before them all the visions which I had seen in sleep, and I began to speak the words of righteousness and to reprimand the heavenly watchers. So here God is using a man to reprimand the watchers and it is sort of fitting because of what the watchers these fallen angels had done to mankind and what their children their offspring had done devouring mankind and all of the terrible things that had happened on the earth the book of the words of righteousness and of the reprimand of the eternal watchers in accordance with the command of the holy great one in that vision I saw in my sleep what I will now say with the tongue of flesh and with the breath of my mouth, which the Great One has given to men to converse therewith and understand with the heart. As he hath created and given to man the power of understanding the word of wisdom, so hath he created me also and given me the power of reprimanding the watchers, the children of heaven. I wrote out your petition, and in my vision it appeared thus that your petition will not be granted unto you throughout all the days of eternity, and that judgment has been finally passed upon you. Yea, your petition will not be granted unto you. And from henceforth you shall not ascend into heaven unto all eternity. Now remember this part. And in bonds of the earth, remember that in bonds of the earth, the decree has gone forth to bind you for all the days of the world, and that previously you shall have seen the destruction of your beloved son. So before you're bound, you're before that happens, you shall see the destruction of your beloved sons, and ye shall have no pleasure in them, but they shall fall before you by the sword. And your petition on their behalf shall not be granted nor yet on your own, even though you weep and pray and speak all the words contained in the writing which I have written, and the vision was shown to me thus, Behold, in the vision clouds invited me, and a mist summoned me, and the course of the stars and lightning sped and hastened me, and the winds in the vision caused me to fly and lifted me upward and bore me into heaven. And I went in till I drew nigh to a wall which is built of crystals and surrounded by tongues of fire. And it began to affright me, and I went into the tongues of fire and drew nigh to a large house which was built of crystals. And the walls of the house were like a tessellated floor made of crystals, and its groundwork was of crystal. Its ceiling was like the path of the stars and the lightnings, and between them were fiery cherubim, and their heaven was clear as water. A flaming fire surrounded the walls, and its portals blazed with fire. And I entered into that house. And it was hot as fire and cold as ice. There were no delights of life therein. Fear covered me and trembling got hold upon me. And as I quaked and trembled, I fell upon my face and I beheld the vision. And lo, there was a second house, greater than the former. And I believe that this is the first covenant and the second covenant. And the second covenant is the greater covenant. Then I behold a vision. And lo, there was a second house greater than the former. And the entire portal stood open before me. And it was built of flames of fire. In every respect, it so excelled in splendor and magnificence and extent that I cannot describe it to you, its splendor and its extent. And its floor was of fire, and above it were lightnings, and the path of the stars, and its ceiling also was flaming fire. And I looked and saw therein a lofty throne. Its appearance was as crystal, and the wheels thereof 
that uh, sounds like Ezekiel, as the shining sun, and there was the vision of cherubim. And from underneath the throne came streams of flaming fire, so that I could l not look thereon. And the great glory sat thereon, and his raiment shone more brightly than the sun, and was whiter than any snow. None of the angels could enter and could behold his face by reason of the magnificence and glory, and no flesh could behold him. And the flaming fire was round about him, and a great fire stood before him, and none around him could draw nigh him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him, yet he needed no counselor. So it's saying the angels couldn't draw near, no one could draw near, but that same reference, ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. This is the left, this is the raptured saints stood before him, yet he needed no counselor. And the most holy ones who were nigh to him did not leave by night nor depart from him. And until then I had been prostrate on my face, trembling, and the Lord called me with his own mouth and said to me, Come hither, Enoch, and hear my word. And one of the holy ones came to me and waked me, and he made me rise up and approach the door, and I bowed my face downwards. And he answered, and he said to me, and I heard his voice, Fear not, Enoch, thou righteous man and scribe of righteousness. Approach hither and hear my voice, and go say to the watchers of heaven, who have sent thee to intercede for them. You should intercede for men, and not men for you. Wherefore have ye left the high, holy, and eternal heaven, and lain with women, and defiled yourselves with daughters of men, and taken to yourselves wives, and done like the children of earth, and begotten giants as your sons? And though ye were, and catch that word, were, holy, spiritual, living the eternal life, you have defiled yourselves with the blood of women, and have begotten children with the blood of flesh, and as the children of men have lusted after flesh and blood, as those do who die and perish. Therefore have I given them wives also, that they might impregnate them and beget children by them, that thus nothing might be wanting to them on earth. And then he says to the watchers, but you were formally spiritual. Let's just stop there real quick. You might wonder, well, how could an angel come down to earth and take a human woman as their wife and bear children with them? I mean, how, can, how could that possibly be? Well, it says you were formally spiritual. Remember in um, the book of, uh, in the story of Abraham, where the Lord himself came down and he said, I came down to see if what I've heard is true about what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. And the Lord came down with two angels. Well, it says in there that they ate a meal with Abraham. Obviously, angels can eat a meal because they did so. You know, the word says that we... Um, might entertain angels unaware. And that word entertaining is referring to sitting down and having a meal with them. So obviously the angels who have a celestial body, they can go from the dimension of heaven, the third heaven, into the physical dimension, and they can eat they can do all of these types of things when they're in the physical dimension. So it's saying here in Enoch, but you were formally spiritual, living the eternal life and immortal for all generations of the world. And therefore, I have not appointed wives for you, for as for the spiritual ones of heaven, in heaven is their dwelling. And now the giants who are produced from the spirits and flesh shall be called evil spirits upon the earth and on the earth shall be their dwelling. Evil spirits have proceeded from their bodies, because they are born from men, and from the holy watchers is their beginning and primal origin. They shall be evil spirits on earth, and evil spirits shall they be called. Now think about that. That sure explains a lot. So the giants were set to go against each other. They kill each other, but they are spirit and flesh, so... They, God saying that they shall be called evil spirits. They can't go to heaven because heaven is designed for mankind. They can't go to the holding place of hell where man go to be held. So where are they? They're on the earth. Now listen to this as it goes on. As for the spirits of heaven, in heaven shall be their dwelling. But as for the spirits of the earth which were born upon the earth, on the earth shall be their dwelling. And the spirits of the giants, so these are the dead giants, their spirits, which God says to call evil spirits, 
They're roaming the earth, and it says, The spirits of the giant shall afflict, oppress, destroy, attack, do battle, and work the destruction on the earth, and cause trouble. It says they take no food because they're spirits, but nevertheless they hunger and thirst because they used to have a physical body and they long to have a physical body. That's why evil spirits are always trying to occupy someone if at all possible. And if not, it says what they do. Their evil spirits afflict, oppress, destroy, attack, do battle, and work destruction on the earth and cause trouble. And they take no, fo no food and but nevertheless, they hunger and thirst and cause offenses. And these spirits shall rise up against the children of men and against the women because they have proceeded from them. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read that, this sure explains a lot. Um, it explains a lot. From the days of the slaughter and destruction and death of the giants, from the souls of whose flesh the spirits, having gone forth, shall destroy without incurring judgment, thus shall they destroy until the day of the consummation, the great judgment in which the age shall be consummated over the watchers and the godless, yea, shall be wholly consummated. And now as to the watchers who have sent thee to intercede for them who have been aforetime in heaven, say to them, You have been in heaven, but all the mysteries had not yet been revealed to you, and you knew the worthless ones, and these worthless ones and the hardness of your heart you've made known to the women and through these mysteries women and men work much evil on the earth say to them therefore you have no peace so just before we close let's quickly review genesis 6 9 and it says these are the generations of noah noah was a just man and perfect in his generations and noah walked with god that word perfect, I had always heard previously that it was translated that Noah was morally perfect, that it had to do with righteousness. And of course, in the New Testament, we do know that Noah, uh, it was said of him that he was a preacher of righteousness. But in Hebrew, the word here for perfect is tamen. And tamen means without blemish. It is the technical word for bodily and physical perfection. It has nothing to do with moral perfection. It's translated, that word tamen, which is the word here where it says perfect in Genesis 6-9, it's translated without blemish as it relates to animals of sacrificial purity. And you can see all of the Bible references here where it's translated without blemish. It's also translated without spot in several uh, places in Numbers. So this shows that Genesis 6-9 does not speak of Noah's moral perfection, but it tells us that he and his family alone were kept pure, that they didn't have a genetic mutation going on, in spite of the prevailing corruption and mutations brought about by the fallen angels, the Watchers. So this concludes part one of the Bible study, as it was in the days of Noah, so it shall be at the coming of the Son of Man. Part two, we're going to get started with other Bible references that indicate that the sons of God are angels, and we have a lot of great information for you in addition to that in part two. Thank you for your time, and we look forward to sharing more with you in the next study.